So welcome everybody. This is Hillary Topper from We Are Triathletes and um, I'm here today. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Jeff Galloway. Um, I think the world of Jeff, he knows that. And um, I'm also, in full disclosure, a program director for Long Island region. Um, but Jeff will talk about all the different training programs across the country and across, around the world. And we've got, Jeff, we've got uh, members from all over the place. So, you know, we, could, we can address that. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Jeff Galloway. Welcome, Jeff, to the show. Well, thank you, Hillary. You're doing a fantastic job of getting the word out about training as well as about uh, how you can combine exercise with life. So way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so my first question is, talk to us about the run-walk-run method. How did you start this and what is it all about? Well, I started it because I was asked to teach a course in beginning running, which of course you're doing right now yourself. You're getting a, a, a number of people uh, who enjoy running, who have never done it before. And what I discovered really quickly is that these novices weren't able to run very far without huffing and puffing or experiencing some type of discomfort. And so I realized right off the bat that I needed to put walk breaks in there for most of the people. And in fact, I actually uh, found that everybody uh, was benefiting from the walk breaks because it kept people together. It, it allowed the groups to stay together. We initially divided up into three groups and I found that um, people started communicating with one another because of the walk breaks. In other words, it, people who run nonstop tend to string out and there's just not as much conversation. But when you keep people together at the right pace, they communicate, they like being there, they support one another, lifelong friendships are formed. Now at the end of the 10 week class, uh, there were two things that happened. First of all, every one of these beginners finished either a 5K or a 10K, but the thing I was most proud of, there were no injuries, none. Uh, not during the program, not during the race itself, and in a follow-up six months later, most of those novices were still running and were telling me how much this had enhanced their life. That's awesome. So do you use the run, walk, run method when you run? Absolutely. And um, I taught the method to uh, beginners first in the 70s. And by the late 70s, I started using it myself. I had been using it on long runs because I found that I would recover fast when I did that. But I really didn't use it on most of the shorter runs until 1978. And uh, I'm proud to say that since I started using Run, Walk, Run on practically every run, I have not had a single running injury. I have gone injury free now for almost 40 years. And it's really run, walk, run was the only change in that. That's amazing. Now, talk to us a little bit. I mean, we've got people um, in on the team and on Team Galloway, Long Island, who are either running an Ironman, you know, they're, they're racing an Ironman, or they're, um, or a half Ironman, or they're doing a marathon or a half marathon. So, you know, Talk to us about this run, walk, run method and how it could really help an Ironman or a half Ironman or a marathon or a half marathon, longer races. Well, in analyzing the injuries that occur in our Galloway programs that we've been, that we've had for uh, over 40 years, 43 years now uh, is, is the length of time, uh, we found that the most common reason is that uh, runners are running too fast on long runs. And this has been verified in a lot of other studies that have been made by sports medicine uh, organizations throughout these decades. And it keeps popping up as the number one cause of injury. Now, 
The number one way to avoid that is to insert walk brakes from the beginning. Not only does that keep the pace slow enough, but it does something that's even better. It stops the continuous use of the muscles, the tendons, the feet, the legs, the joints, and it allows them to reset so that not only uh, is there less damage, but the muscles stay resilient. So you're strong all the way to the end. Uh, the bottom line on all this it comes from a book called The Story of the Human Body, written by an uh, evolutionary biologist from Harvard, who believes, as do other anthropologists who study ancient man, that we really weren't designed for running more than about 200 yards at one time, that our ancestors walked practically everywhere they went and only ran to get away from a predator. But uh, we can run, and if we run in segments where we are competent, then we don't break things down and we keep the muscles strong. Now what this means for people doing triathlons and, and half marathons and things like that is that they become the ones at the end who are the passers instead of being passed. And the times are faster, the times uh, when a non-stopper finds the right run, walk, run. The average improvement in a half marathon is over seven minutes and in a full over 13 minutes. So how do you actually find that right pace? I mean, is it just really experimentation or, you know, should we, you know, talk maybe a little bit about the magic mile? Yes, you can uh, <clears throat> either use a, uh, the current finish time from a half marathon or a marathon or you can use our Magic Mile time trial that has nailed the uh, performance potential that a person has based on more than 60,000 instances of people who've reported in their Magic Mile times and times in other races. So you crunch the numbers and we can come up with an accurate prediction. And the way we do that mathematically is we will take the Magic Mile time and multiply it by 1.3 because 30% is the slowdown we see from a fast one mile to a fast per mile pace in a marathon. Then once we've done that, that will give uh, a potential all out marathon pace if everything was perfect, uh, which of course it often never is, but at least you know what the perfect potential would be. But we want to at least slow that pace down uh, by two minutes per mile, and that gives what has been a very safe pace for long runs. So again, you take magic mile time, multiply by 1.3, and add two minutes. Example, you run 10 minutes flat in the magic mile. 1.3 relates to 13 minutes in an all-out marathon, and then you add two more minutes. 15 minutes per mile would be the long run pace. Now, once you get that long run pace, then you set up our recommendations on the run, walk, run. Uh, at a 15 minute per mile pace, for example, it would be run 15 seconds and walk 30. At 13 and 14 minutes per mile, 30, 30, 20, 20, or 15, 15. At uh, 11 and 12 minutes per mile, 60, 30, or even 30, 30, and so forth. It seems to me that when you do, say, a 30-30 or a 15-30 or even a 10-30 or a 90-30 or whatever, that it doesn't really matter what pace you're going. It, it just seems like it's, it all actually equals out. You know, I'm noticing that with me. Like, I'll go 90-30 you know, for a mile, and then the next mile I'll do 30-30. And I notice that it's exactly the same. Can you explain how that could be? Well, that's very common. And obviously at some point, you can be running such a short amount and walking much longer so that you will slow down, which on long runs is not a problem. It's a benefit because uh, you get the same endurance even if you walk the long runs. So if you're injured or something, you can stay on track towards your goal on the long runs by just simply walking the distance. But getting to your question, why can you run the same pace at 30-30 
that you can run at 90-30. It's because when you have a short amount of running, you your legs stay resilient and you can run faster. Uh, almost everybody can run faster for 30 seconds than the pace they would use when running for 90 seconds. And then by getting that regular walk break, your legs are revived so that you can keep going. Uh, a 90-30 versus a 30-30 on a long run is going to produce a lot more fatigue with the 90-30. Um, talk a little bit about, this, this happens a lot too, where I tell people, we start our group, we have a group of about 20 people. And we usually start off really slow at like five second run or 10 second run, 30 second walk. Okay. And people look at me and they say, you're nuts. Like, this is ridiculous. Why are we doing this? It, it, there's no, it, it, you know, and what, so talk to us a little bit about that. I guess it's the ego thing. And also, um, yeah. And um, yeah, let's talk about that first. <laughs> well, that's a very valid question. It's a question that I get a lot. And uh, the answer to that is goes back to the story of the human body uh, and the research that went behind that book, showing that we really were not designed for nonstop running. And if you have not been doing running, or if you've not been doing very much running, then you need to gradually introduce the body to the running motion. And once you do that, the body will adapt to it if you have uh, not too much running and more walking at first, but do it regularly and very slowly build up the way you're doing in your program. That's just such an amazing way that brings people into running without aches and pains. Now, the, the very short segments may be too easy for people, but there's nothing wrong for a beginner to do that. Where people err and get injured and get exhausted and then get burned out is when they bite off too much and suddenly say, well, I'm beyond the five or 10 seconds. I'm gonna run 30 or 40 seconds. Well, after a few runs, they don't feel good and, and they, they lose interest and they drop out and don't get these amazing mental benefits that you get from running better than any other activity in life. Well, let's talk about people with a little bit of experience who are also part of this group and they're going five, 10 seconds. I mean, is there benefit for them? If a person has not been running in the last two months, then the, they should go back to the beginner stage to readapt the body to the running motion. And it's all about patience at that point. Let these body parts readapt to running, and then you can proceed uh, more later on. But uh, the biggest mistake that runners who are coming back after a layoff do is that they try to resume what they were doing before. Mm -hmm. And because they've had the layoff, the body parts are not ready for that, and they break down. So ease back into it, and the veterans will be able eventually to progress more rapidly, but you've got to put that front end of reintroduction so that things don't break. In earlier books that you've written, Jeff, you've talked about taking a one minute break as opposed to now you believe in a 30 second or less break. Can you explain why? Yeah, um, the method of run, walk, run has never been studied in clinical trials, uh, mainly because uh, the research funds are going into cancer and things like that, which they should. But uh, our database is quite large now. We, I have heard individually from more than half a million runners over the last 43 years, and I still uh, get newbies every single day of the year. Dozens of, of new people tell me how this works, and, they often have some problem or question. So I send them an answer that almost always involves an adjustment of their run, walk, run. So I sort through all of the replies that come back to me as to how these things have worked, over half a million now. And what I base 
the run, walk, run on is success. Success in avoiding injuries, success in being able to stay motivated, and then success in achieving goals and running faster. Now, over the last 10 years, we've actually been able to study the effect of how long a walk break would be by I designated several programs and several individuals that I work with so that I could control the data and, and what, how they facilitated it. And what we found is that 30 seconds bestowed the maximum amount of recovery from a run segment. And when you walk longer than 30 seconds, you actually slow down. And then it becomes harder and harder on long runs to restart again. So there's slower time. And indeed, uh, I hear from people almost every day that convert from having run three minutes and walking one. And the only change they make when they hear about the 30 seconds is they run 90 seconds and walk 30. It's the same ratio, but the average improvement time and a half is four minutes faster. Four minutes faster and all you did is drop down to 90, 30 versus three and one. Interesting. I'm going to open this up now to a couple of the callers. Um, let me just uh, unmute everybody so that, um, okay. All right. Does anybody, do you guys have any questions? Uh, I do. A uh, personal question if uh, how this would work for me. Um, I'm in my 11th year of triathlon, and one of my biggest challenges is that um, whenever I race 13.1, whether it's part of a triathlon or a standalone half marathon, I get leg cramping. And by mile nine or 10, I'm being forced to walk when I don't want to be walking. Um, and I have an upcoming Ironman, and I really, really don't want to get to the point where I'm being forced to walk. So I'd like to start um, a planned run walk, and I'm just not sure how to really get it started and going. Okay, let me address that, because uh, a lot of people assume that uh, cramping is the result of lack of sodium, and usually it's not. In our experience, we found that it's the adjustment of the run, walk, run, but you must take the liberal walk breaks from the very beginning. And there are a lot of variables here, but uh, the classic way to determine that is to look at what your overall pace per mile uh, has been in previous uh, uh, races of that same distance. So mm -hmm. tell me on uh, one of your recent uh, races where you cramped up, what was your overall pace per mile? Um, I don't know it by pace, um, but in the last- What was half, your time? It was about um, 2 at 2.30 for uh, the half marathon part. Two, two hours, hours and what? 30 minutes, 35 okay. minutes. So that's, uh, that's about 11.30 per mile pace. And mm -hmm. so uh, that would uh, indicate normally a 60-30 or 40-20 or what I use to qualify for Boston, run 30 seconds and walk 15. So those are the usual uh, usages and uh, strategies. However, because you've had cramping in the past, I would recommend to you that you start out at 30-30. And hmm. by doing that, you're gonna save those leg muscles and they're gonna be much less likely to cramp by the end of the race. Okay, and... Um... You like to keep it really short, I see, because in the past, I, I, you know, I hear people talking about, you know, running three minutes, walking one, or running four, walking one, but um, I, you've really moved away from that. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the maximum amount of benefit from a walk break we're finding to be 30 seconds, and if you walk longer than that, you actually slow down. But at the other end of the spectrum, it's the longer running segments of two minutes, three minutes, that really produce dramatic fatigue by the end of the race and cause cramping. And again, when people shift from say a three minutes, one minute to 90-30 or even 60-30, the cramps tend to go away. Mm -hmm. 
sounds like it's something that you'd really have to get used to the starting stopping all the time. Um, Just get one of our timers. Uh, you, you'll see these, they're only 20 bucks and they're uh, jeffgalloway.com and you can set them for whatever you want. My recommendation in your case would be to set it for 3030 and then mm -hmm. during the first uh, three to four miles, just go with 3030. If you're feeling good at that point, then you could run two of those and walk one. So you run okay. 60, 30, and then if you're feeling good at the end, you can do three of them and do 90, 30. Okay, thank you. You know, Nicole brings up a good point. A lot of people say this to me as well, you know, it's that stopping and starting. But what I've been explaining is that, you know, if you're using that accelerated glide and you glide into it and then glide out of it, that it, it almost becomes like a one swoop kind of motion, right? That you're, isn't that correct? You're absolutely right, Hillary. The acceleration glider is a drill that we designed and we put into the program in order to help people learn how to be seamless when they move from a walk break into a little shuffle and then into a slow jog and then into a regular pace. And normally then, when you go back down to a walk break, you're just coasting back into it. Uh, at first, you may not be seamless and that's why the drill's there. Doing four to eight of those once or twice a week will get you seamless and you'll be smoother and smoother in other aspects of running too. Is that something you have a, a video on or? Mm -hmm. How's that? Is there, do you have a, a video or something that demonstrates the stream? There is a video clip and you should uh, be able to access that from our website, jeffgalloway.com. I will okay. warn you, uh, our technical folks are revising the websites and our website and uh, from time to time they won't have that video clip up there and then they'll put it back in when they're uh, putting some other components in so for the next month there might be some issues with it but give it a try and uh, okay. it, it will be up there wonderful thank you. If you come to one of our retreats I teach those in person and mm -hmm. hands-on and we have uh, a number of wonderful retreats and Carmel, California, uh, the Panhandle of Florida. Uh, I'm just about to start one tomorrow in, at Lake Tahoe, California, and they're just <laughs> wonderful, but they do involve <laughs> hands-on nice. training. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm actually planning to go to the Carmel <laughs> one. I'm gonna do that in April. I'm definitely there. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> it's fabulous, Hillary. We could uh, invite your folks to come and meet you, work with you as well as me. So right. we, we we need to do that. That would be awesome. Um, do you guys, um, Dawn, Janeth, I know you guys are on the line. Do you guys have any questions? No? Dawn? <laughs> no? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, anybody else? Um, Nicole, have any questions? I mean, I, I think um, maybe, Jeff, you can talk about how you have these training programs around the country and around the world, um, you know, just, you know, and how somebody could sign up. Yeah, Hillary and I talked mainly because of the work that Hillary does. And the thought hit her uh, about a year after we started our training conversations that she might want to start a program in, on, in her area, Long Island, and uh, she has, and, she's, and you can testify to the wonderful feelings you get from helping people improve the quality of their life because they don't hurt. With our method, they don't hurt. And we now have over 80 programs around mostly the US. We have them in a few other countries. We just opened one in Australia and uh, Israel and uh, Germany and, and Italy. Um, so we do have a wide range of these. Uh, you can check at jeffgalloway.com, hit training programs, and then look at your locale and see if there's something there. And if not, you can start one. We have coaches that will coach you into how to set this up and also how to conduct the program. And then, of course, I'm available for questions at any time, if you have questions about the method. 
The other thing to mention, too, is that um, Jeff had helped me with the New York City Marathon last year, which I am totally, totally grateful for. And um, I, you know, he is available. So if anybody wants to, you know, do like virtual coaching or anything like that, he's available on a one on one as well. And he does that virtually. Yes, and we have a, a, a two different uh, sessions like that. The, the first one is called e-coaching, and I do that individually. And so uh, each person uh, checks in with me once a week, and I fine-tune things, and there's always things that need to be fine-tuned, and there are always questions about things, and I can answer them directly. Uh, another format that is not as interactive but does have some is called Customized, and that's conducted by our uh, national training uh, officer, Chris Twiggs. And what Chris does is set up the program for whatever your goal is and whatever issues you have on scheduling. And then he has chat rooms uh, once a week if you need to ask any questions there. I have one last question. So talk a little bit about the negative split. I keep telling my people about it, you know, that we want to, you know, go out slow and then halfway through the race, pick up the pace. So can you just talk a little bit about that? that yeah, that, and that's uh, really a very good advice because the most common mistake that people make in running races is starting out too fast. And most people don't realize they're starting out too fast. Of course, now with GPS watches, that excuse has been taken away, but people <laughs> still try to use it. Uh, but the research over the years, and I'm talking about going back 50 years, shows that the very best way to achieve your potential on race day is to run the second half faster than first. Uh, and one reason is that in the beginning of a race, your legs aren't warmed up, and it simply is much harder work to run the pace that you will eventually average because you're working against your legs. They're not warmed up yet. You're forcing them to run at a pace that they're not quite ready to. So if you start out a little bit slower than that, the legs can warm up. And then at the end, you're the one that's picking up the pace. And again, the research shows that almost all the world records in distance events occur when people run the second half faster than the first half. And of course, the reason there is you restrain your enthusiasm during the first mile or so of your race, and then you can reap those rewards at the end. So just, just putting it into practical matter here. We have this race coming up in, uh, on Saturday. A couple of you know, the people in my group were doing an ice cream run. Um, and then after that, we're going right into a half marathon training. Um, when we do this race, and a lot of people have asked me this, uh, they, they would start at a slower run-walk-run ratio and then halfway through, make it a little bit longer of a run and less of a walk. Yes. And, with me. Right. And of course, an easy way to facilitate that is to set it up. If you're planning on doing something like 60, 30 or 40, 20, then you would start out with the equal amounts. Uh, if it were 60, 30, you'd uh, start out with 30, 30. And without changing your watch, when you feel good, you can run two of those 30s and walk one. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Perfect. All right, just, you know, one last call out to anybody who has any questions. All right, and then without further ado, I'm going to thank you very much, Jeff, for being here with us at We Are Triathletes. We really, really appreciate your time. And, um, you know, hopefully we'll have you back in a couple of months. Well, Hillary, as you know, I'm available. I want to help you because you're doing wonderful things. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for being on the line too.